Oriental fables relating to Zen and Taoism is the wonderful series of crude but delightful old woodblock prints called the Ten Bowls. We do not know exactly where this symbolism originated. It was probably in China. But from China it migrated to Korea and later to Japan. And among the Japanese people, the quaintness and simplicity, naivete of the little group of pictures, found a special favor. And uh, it has, this series has been built into most of the texts on Zen that have been prepared in Japan in the last three or four hundred years. And among those, who have written delightful commentaries on it. We must list Dr. Suzuki and other prominent exponents of Japanese and mysticism. The whole concept is an effort to explain the relationship of being and body, or perhaps more generally, Consciousness as the indwelling spirit of reality and the personality, which is the always clumsy, always inconsistent element in the human compound. It is said that a disciple once asked a Chinese sage, what is Buddha? And the old master replied, It is a man seeking a bull or an ox while he is riding on it. And this, to a degree, is the uh, basis of this peculiar but wonderful fable. The human being, according to Zen and Taoism, consists of a, of a principle manifesting mostly as an instinct and a personality manifesting mostly as an appetite. So there is a continual struggle in the human compound between principle and personality, between the instinct to achieve to some noble destiny and the appetite which holds us to the commonplace. The personality of man is likened, therefore, to this bull or ox. It is represented, to begin with, as in a wild and primitive state, living in a very pleasant valley, and used to the concept of perfect liberty. This ox, like a young horse that has never been ridden, has no concept of ever being bound to the service of anything. So the bull or ox in his native state represents the individual who gambles about the pasture as the wild animal does, free of all burden, free of all need, simply surviving for the pleasure of survival itself. In the human being, of course, the situation is somewhat refined, but not especially improved. The ox is that part of man which intends to do exactly as it pleases and always has. It is that part of man which, if it is angry, is angry, and has no reason to doubt its privilege to be angry. The ox is selfish because it is its nature to be selfish. It loathes responsibility because it has never been taught to assume any burden or duty. It carries no load. It serves no purpose. 
and it tills no field. Uh, this ox also represents whatever the individual at the moment is resolved to accomplish. His wants, his desires, his appetites, his ambitions, all these are part of the study of the black ox. And this creature has never even considered the possibility of being something other than it is. And here is where we get very close to the beginning of our Zen and Taoist study. That is the realization that any creature can become something that it is not. That is, it can manifest attributes or qualities the existence of which it is not aware. Surely the potential has to be there, but man cannot be that which he lacks the root or substance for. But he can have thoughts that he not, never expected to have. He can live in a way that is different from his common and general feeling about the proper way to live. So it is part of the Zen philosophy that it is conceivable that the human being can control his own personality. Now at first this doesn't sound like a very extraordinary achievement. Many people will say instantly that they can control themselves person told me not long ago that they had marvelous self-control. The only thing is they never had any desire to use it. And that is about where the situation rests. We are all quite certain that we can do anything we want to do. But when the time comes, we never want to do anything very different from what we have done. And if the desire to do something better does come along, it lasts only a little while, goes to sleep again, unfulfilled. But in Zen, there is this definite belief, this preachment, that man can take hold of his own life. He may have been born impatient and lived half his lifetime in an impatient mood. But it is possible for him to be patient. He may have lived in a highly competitive way, seeking only the satisfaction of his own desire. But it is possible for this person to be unselfish. He may never achieve this possibility in a present life, but it is still a possibility. For any individual can do that which he will to do. He can control his temper. He can refine his nature. He can overcome bad habits. He can break uh, the bonds of alcoholism or narcotic, narcotics if he wants to. If he has the deep and serious determination to be better than he is, and the willingness and the consistency to improve, there is nothing reasonable to man that he cannot accomplish. So our little scene opens in the story of the bull with a boy, the shepherd, or the keeper of the cattle, who is holding in his hand a very tempting morsel of green fodder and trying to attract the attention of the large black bull that is rushing by, going in the opposite direction from the boy. The boy is going one way, and the bull is cheerfully going in the opposite way. And the boy is holding out his morsel of food to try to lure the bull over. This is the approach. This is the beginning of the struggle uh, to bring the personality under the control of principles or of reality. 
And as the personality goes a little hitch headlong way across the pasture, the boy holds out the green herb. And on the side of the hill, back of the boy, is a pine tree growing. And in the sky above the bowl is a very deep, heavy cloud. There is a setting for this particular situation. And the setting is the beginning of the Buddha's Zen Taoist preachment. The herb that the boy is holding out as an inducement is the hope that through self-control the individual will escape misery. This is the temptation which is intended to lure the bull to the point where he can be bridled. The hope always is that man, following his own personal, selfish, self-centered way, is finally going to become so miserable so burdened with the inevitable consequences of his own conduct that he will receive the first inspiration of leadership from the boy in the form of an answer to some immediate problem. As the individual goes along, sickness strikes him, his home is disrupted, his business does not succeed well. His friends depart from him. And he discovers that this wild life of freedom that he has thought so much about and labored so desperately to preserve isn't paying off anything. He is free, but freedom has become his bondage. The very liberties which he believed he wanted have led only to the excesses in his own nature which have crippled him and injured him. So the doctrine, which is always the evergreen, the symbol of enlightenment, in Buddhism the Buddhist message is represented by the pine branch. This represents the promise of a more abundant life. It is the inducement also uh, to bring conduct under the dominion of character. The health may be improved, that the daily problems that we face can be more easily overcome. And so the boy uses the only inducement that he can use. The bull is selfish, so the boy appeals to its appetite. And no matter how selfish we may be, we also want to be happy. And in our selfishness to be happy, we are brought gradually into the presence of learning. For we come to know in the end that only learning can make us happy. That only the improvement of our own minds and our own lives can solve the problems that make us unhappy. So the boy waves his luring bait before the animal. And when we turn to the second picture in this delightful series, we find that the animal has done the expected. He has gotten close enough to the boy for the boy to be able to put a halter on him. He has become more docile because he has gained confidence in the boy. He has gained confidence in the self. He found that when he came close and took the food that the boy offered, that no evil happened to him. The bull found that the food was tasty, that it was even more pleasant than that which was gained by going out and foraging for oneself. He also found that the boy was kind. And the doctrine which was symbolized by the young shepherd was a gentle doctrine, a wise and friendly belief. And so the bull did not object greatly when the halter was slipped over its head, for it found that the yoke was easy, and that the law, instead of being a terrible thing that was going to take away from it every liberty and freedom, was really bringing it into a relationship with insight or a relationship with knowledge. The shepherd could make life better for the ox. 
the boy could make the uh, life of the animal more secure. For human wisdom, or the wisdom of philosophy, can protect not only uh, the inner part of man's nature, but also his outer nature as well, if man himself will permit. So a friendship is established between the ox and the boy, and the two together now head in the same direction. Through the beginnings of wisdom, a fraternity, a relationship, a kinship has been built between the consciousness in man and the body which must fulfill the works of consciousness. Buddha very directly in his own teachings explains uh, that it is not the purpose of the doctrine to make the personality uh, a troubled creature or to take away from man any of the really good things which he can enjoy or hope to have. The purpose of consciousness is to enrich the person so that the things we have become really meaningful, that joy becomes real joy, that insight becomes real insight, and that understanding becomes a practical instrument for the achievement of everything that is reasonable and desirable. Once man has accepted the yoke of the doctrine, Everything in his life is made simpler, uh, made uh, more convenient for him. He moderates his intensities and has less pain and sorrow. He controls his appetites and his body is healthier. He achieves moderation of goods and his worries are fewer. And so under the guidance of the boy, the ox begins his gradual transformation. And you will notice in the picture that when the boy has finally got the bridle on the ox, the nose, the very tip of the ox's nose, has turned white. Up to that time, it was all black. Of course, the black ox was the symbol of ignorance, of darkness, of benightedness. But after the yoke has been placed upon the animal, the place where the yoke is has turned white. This is the beginning of the transmutation of the ox. It is the beginning of the transformation of character. Also, as you look, you will observe that the landscape has changed. The dark clouds are gone. There are pleasant trees and mountains and a beautiful expanse of water. It is a very much more charming, verdant land than it was before. And the ox is slowly and ponderously turning in its course to follow the leadership of the boy. This is also the beginning of discipline. For in one hand now, the boy carries a rod. Now, we do not see the boy injure the animal with the rod, but the thought or concept of discipline is introduced. In this case, the discipline represents the leadership of consciousness over the body. It means that the boy now has the advantage. He is able to command the body, and maybe reluctantly, the body will obey. It has been a very delicate operation to get this far in this partnership. And working as we do all the time with folks, I may say that getting that halter on to the bowl has taken many a sincere person 10 or 15 years of hard work. Always remember that that first effort is the most difficult. Uh, we, we resent so desperately the very solutions to our problems. Uh, worshiping this sense of the right to do anything we please, we forget to please to do anything. Still we maintain 
that we have this inalienable right to be miserable, uh, to fulfill whatever purpose we intend. And any subtraction from this privilege is tyranny, even though the teacher may be wiser than we are. If the teacher interferes with our right to do as we please, he is a tyrant. So it is quite a strategic undertaking to finally reach the point where the personality with its mind, emotions, and the psychic integration is willing to accept the leadership of the consciousness itself. But here the bull has finally done so, and the end of its nose is appropriately emerging from the dark cloud of its own matter or materialism. And the reason why the end of the nose is probably so pictured first is because the first release is on the level of the most physical of our appetites. It is on the level of our sensory perception, represented by the face of the animal. And having gone this far, we turn the page and we come to the third picture of the bull. And here we have a very docile, pleasant scene indeed. Here the bull is following the boy along the edge of a pleasant stream. And we cannot re but remember the words of the psalmist, He leadeth me beside the still waters. Well, that is exactly what is happening in the picture, precisely what is happening. The boy no longer has his rod either. He is now carrying a flowering branch, which again suggests, perhaps, the mysterious rod of Joseph that budded, or the mysterious uh, shepherd's staff of Tanoiza. At this stage of the development of the theme, the entire head of the ox is now white. This means it's rational or upper part. In the highest part of the personality, the mind, is now liberated, at least theoretically, from bondage. The ox, however, is still haltered and the boy is still holding the cord. Principle must still lead. And the consciousness must still direct the way, otherwise uh, the ox would stray and would not continue its journey. But the mind, now having been relieved of its darkness, represented by the head turning white, shows an immediate fondness for the boy. The ox and the boy are now truly comrades. And the ox is very happy in this newfound relationship. And in this relationship we find something of philosophy. For in philosophy the mind has accepted the leadership of consciousness. The mind has taken over a certain rulership even over the body itself. Like the great enlightened thinker, the sage, the seer. Uh, the mind has resolved to follow in the footsteps of the leader, of the boy, and finds its greatest joy now in that obedience which once it resented. With the mind more clearly developed, the purposes of life become more obvious. It is no longer necessary to tempt the ox with better fodder or fine foods. It is simple enough for the ox to understand the commands of the boy. Therefore, in this scene, the boy is speaking to the ox, and the ox understands him. There is now the relationship between consciousness and an instrument being developed within the personality itself which understands consciousness and can respond naturally and properly to the commands that consciousness gives. 
So here is almost the relationship of master and disciple in the old Eastern way of learning. For in the old way, the disciple was the servant of a master. Surely this servitude was done only for one purpose, the good of the disciple. But in all the older systems, the disciple, the disciple was taught absolute obedience. He had no right to question or doubt the will of his teacher. He had only the right to accept immediately any demand placed upon him. And the demands were usually such as would humble his pride or demand from him great patience or resignation, endurance and tranquility of spirit under pressure. These were the things that the philosophy of life dealt with. So now the uh, ox with its fine white head follows quietly behind the boy. The rope is slack. The animal is following mostly of its own accord. He just needs a little leadership now and then. And consciousness itself turns back a little to encourage the ox to come along the way of life. Very simple, natural little pattern. The next scene, the transmutation of the ox has continued, and now the area of the heart is white. And the animal is white uh, in the entire forepart of the body. This means that not only has the mind been regenerated and uh, elevated, but now the emotions have been purified. The desires have been transformed. And the most difficult problem that man ever has to face, the pressure of appetite, has been successfully uh, met. We can often uh, reason things out. And if the reason has a chance, we may win. But when some terrible passion racks the body, we are unable to control. That which is a vast emotional strain eclipses reason, drives us from our reasonable purposes, blinds us to the consequences of our own conduct, and under the pressure or stress of emotion, we are no longer thoughtful or rational creatures. But though the bull or the ox has reached the point where this part of its nature is also transmuted, and regenerated. And now another very interesting thing is happening. The boy is now tying the ox to a tree. This tying the ox to the tree instead of to the boy becomes therefore the next step or part of this uh, transformation or transmutation. The boy represents uh, the, the spirit, the consciousness, the insight, the natural good in man, uh, seeking to bring the body into a state of redeemed relationship with life. But the tree has a greater meaning. And all through the mystery of Buddhism, the, the tree plays a tremendously important part. It was under a tree the garden of the palace of Kapilavastu, the Buddha was born. It was under a tree at Bodhagaya, near Madras, that the Buddha was illuminated. And it was under a group of trees on the Indian roadside that Buddha entered the Paranavana. All through his life, the symbol of the tree went with him. And in ancient Buddhist art, particularly in India, the tree was always a symbol of the doctrine. The tree was the great protecting growth under which man could sit and be guarded from the heat of the sun or the wetness of the rain or the force of the wind. He could find security beneath the tree and perhaps also 
he could find there rest and peace. For the tree was the symbol of the oasis. And in the deserts of the Near East, the tree was the emblem of life itself. Wherefore, wherever there were trees, there had to be water. And where there was water, men could hope to live. So now what has happened? The boy consciousness has now tied the ox to the tree. In other words, has bound it to the operations of universal law. The tree is the symbol of the law. It is the symbol of the great doctrine. And this is a step which occurs frequently in the advancement of the purposes of discipleship in the Eastern system. Man himself, be he consciousness or be he body, depends upon the law. And in this real relationship, the human purpose, the human desire, unfolds naturally until it reaches a certain stage or degree of growth. We begin by inwardly desiring to be better people. We begin by seeking to bring to an end the suffering of life. We seek that noble path which leads to the end of misery. And from within ourselves, like the good and kindly people of long ago, we build our little folk philosophies. We say, as the old housewife used to say in the small New England town, I just do the best I can, and I treat everybody fair and square, and that's my philosophy of life. It's a good philosophy. The only thing is, it has its limitations. We go a certain ways, and our own insight, our own instincts, are not strong enough to lead us further. So we must either come at the end to a little better a plain or prairie or pasture and there remain for a while, or else we must shift from our own initiative, from our own beliefs, our own hopes and purposes, from our own interpretations of things. We must shift from these foundations and follow the ancient Buddhist Zen doctrine. I take my refuge in the law. Therefore, the three jewels of Buddhism represent the three symbols of the principles by means of which the individual in this system gained his hope of salvation. For the three jewels were the life of the Buddha, the doctrine of the Buddha, and the assembly of the saints. These were the basis of the formal instruction. And the individual passed from his own uh, efforts to regenerate his own nature and came under the discipline of one of the great world systems, whether it was Buddhism or Platonism or Hinduism or Taoism. This is not so important. But somewhere along the way, the individual must take on the regular disciplines, the ordered leadership of the great schools of wisdom. When he does this, he then takes the personality, which is his instrument. He renounces his own leadership over the personality and binds the personality to the great pattern of existence. He therefore releases the bull from his own control and takes the opportunity to give the animal the strongest leadership, the strongest center, the strongest support possible by binding it to the tree, by tying it to the immovable doctrine, the unchangeable basic law of existence. For it's this way the bull comes into the best instruction, the best leadership, the best help that it can possibly receive. Then also by releasing the bull or ox uh, from his own leadership, 
As man escapes a further negative possibility in his own nature. It is possible that man will renounce all the different things of life. He will renounce a fine home and become a wanderer homeless upon the face of the earth like the monks of old. He will renounce honors like the Taoist mystics of the Diamond Mountains and go off into hermitage in the hills, refusing to hold public office or have any part in the transactions of business or barter or exchange. He may give his wealth to the poor and his body to be burned. He may renounce everything uh, that he possesses. And still, he has not renounced selfness. He has not renounced this mysterious something within the individual that makes him determined in some way to achieve his own purpose regardless of anything. The Buddhist warns that even the determination to become enlightened can be a fixation of the mind which will restrain and limit the disciple. The resolution to be good can quickly become an ambition, a gratification of the psychic determination. The resolution to help others can come, become the basis of a glamorous self-centeredness. Almost anything that the individual desires to do can lead to on to more desiring and thus prevent the final achievement of the end that is most desired, liberation from desire. For unless man is able to achieve freedom from the instinct of desire, he can never completely release himself from the net and web of appetites and are from all the illusions and delusions that the mind can be afflicted by. So when sometimes when we think that we have reached a high plateau of vision, we are really only under some form of paranoid pressure and we do not know the difference. So the boy ties the bowl to the tree and gives up the leadership of the bull. The boy now has no longer the right to control or to dictate or to, to, to direct or to demand anything from the animal. The animal or the personality, the symbol of the transitory mind and emotions has now been turned over to the law to be established in it forever. And the, the need of the bull is now that it shall obey the law and not the shepherd. It shall obey the infinite itself and no longer the personal consciousness of man, even though this consciousness may be essentially well-intentioned. So the boy finally sacrifices and gives up his friend, the bull, who is now a rather... Uh, uh, an odd-looking animal with considerable areas of white. The forelegs are white, the shoulders and the chest are white. The transmutation is going on, uh, but the boy is no longer the master of the bull. It has released it. It is no longer leading, demanding, or requiring. And we come to the next picture. And in the next picture, the boy is walking along holding the halter in his hand. Behind him is the bull. The bull is now white to the midriff and uh, is really becoming quite an amazing looking animal. But now the bull follows the boy. There is no halter. Having given up the ox, the boy discovers that he cannot lose it. He discovers that once the personality, the integration of the mental, psychic, emotional complex has progressed to a certain point, 
It changes its own basic psychology and becomes the willing servant of the boy or of consciousness. Now it is the ox that is seeking. Now it is the ox uh, that finds the companionship of the boy the most valuable of all things. Now the mind is turning naturally to the spirit and follows in the way of mystical insight and mystical illumination. We find this everywhere in the story of mysticism, both in Asia and in the Western world. We observe how the mystics, through their years of struggle, sought communion with the infinite sought to mingle their own natures with this universal plan of things. And then sometimes, somewhere, the great wheel of the law turned, and to these mystics came some kind of an inner experience, an actual mystical awakening of life within themselves. And from that moment, uh, the mind, the emotions, the person that we know became, in a sense, the dedicated servant of this experience which had occurred within. Among the Sufis and dervishes of Islam, this experience of God is called the knowledge of the beloved. And the moment the individual has this experience, he becomes the slave of the beloved. He becomes the slave of truth. He follows resolutely in its way, daring all things, patiently, inevitably, following with humbleness but continuity the subtle thread of doctrine that must lead through the mystic maze of things to the final presence of reality. So now, the person has turned and pursues the man. Uh, the, the bull, having achieved this greater enlightenment of itself, having redeemed more and more of its own nature, having purified its own parts with increasing insight, begins to sense the need of consciousness. There comes a point in our own experience of life, each of us, for that which at one time we had to discipline ourselves to achieve suddenly becomes the most necessary of all things. As, in, as inner experience grows, as the divine takes precedence over the human in the mysterious structure of our being, Man suddenly longs for reality. To him it suddenly becomes the all-purpose of things. Whereas before he was looking for the gratifications of the flesh, now he seeks the exaltations of the spirit. So quietly and patiently, and in a very friendly way, the ox now follows the boy without a halter. There is no need any longer of controlling the animal. The animal has found its own light and now uh, chooses to be the companion of the spirit. And the garden of the foliage of the mountainside and the general view is most delightful. And even though the engraving is extremely crude, there is a look of extraordinary contentment on the face of the ox. Uh, the ox is well pleased with the whole thing. The personality now follows the way of the spirit toward truth. In the next picture, the, the ox truly has been made to lie down in green pastures. It is very comfortably curled up on the ground, and now almost all of its nature is white. There is just a small patch of black at the rear with the tail. Otherwise, the ox has now been entirely
transmuted. And it listens with great delight, presumably, to the boy, who seated nearby is charming the bow by playing upon a flute. Here, the spirit truly is entertaining uh, the ox. And the ox is very uh, peaceful, subdued, and quiet. This begins to suggest the teachings of yoga. For in all these Eastern symbols, the foot, with its several openings, becomes a symbol of the mantra and the mudra, the magic vibratory tones and patterns, the secret steps of inner wisdom, the meditations and the contemplations, by means of which man gradually uh, brings the total personality to peace. Here the individual, the person, the being within has brought harmony and beauty and fineness and tranquility to the thoughts and to the passions and to the problems of life. We now have that uh, beautiful pastoral concept a man at peace with all parts of himself and in complete conformity with nature. And for the first time in our picture, the peaks of great mountains rise in the distance. There is a new and universal vista opening. The peaceful soul, dwelling always in the music of reality, is here uh, something like the Indian, East Indian concept of the bull, seated while the divine flutist, Krishna, plays the wonderful melodies of the spirit. The, the spirit, the self, is the great musician, the great harmonizer, the one that strikes the vibrant chords of life, is now entertaining uh, the personality, the outer nature, which has been brought into complete and perfect harmony. The whole scene suggests meditation. It suggests that the individual has now reached a point in which it, he has achieved quietude. And in the uh, quietude of his own inner life, he hears for the first time what Pythagoras called the music of the spheres. He begins to be aware of the celestial harmonies which cannot be heard because of the constant cry and the constant shout and confusion of mortal life. It is only when man is still, quiet, detached from all worldliness, that the wonders of the inner life can be made known to him. It is in this quietude that he hears the voice of the silence. It is in this quietude that the Spirit of God comes close to him as this spirit walked in the garden in the cool of the evening in the old story of Genesis. So here is truly a happy, peaceful, contented scene. And to most people who could hope for such an end, this is paradise itself. All is peace, all is contentment, all is happiness and rest. The striving of the struggle ends and the individual seemingly has reached his goal. But in the Eastern Zen philosophy, this is not the end. This is only a pleasant interlude. This is a promise of still greater things to come, more to be accomplished. But it is certainly the dividing point which brings in the second half of the series. In the, in the sixth picture, it is the first of a second set of five which together make the entire pattern. Here we see the contemplative taking over, the inner life becoming victorious, and the individual turning more and more to the mysteries of the internal in the development of his discipleship and the patterns which lead to his emancipation. Now at this stage of the picture we see in view seven uh, that... Uh, there is no longer any halter on the ox. The ox has had the halter removed. Also, 
All of its body is now white. The boy is now sitting on the far bank of a stream which flows between him and the ox. And the boy is sitting under a tree very quietly in meditation. And the ox is drinking deeply of the waters of everlastingness. Here we have the self which has found its ultimate peace and security. We find the contemplating consciousness detached from all the labors of things and the great liberation which uh, wisdom brings into the life of the person who is truly wise. The wise man is not one who is able to resist temptation. For beyond this is a greater virtue, the simple virtue of being untouched by temptation. Instead of being strong in the presence of problem, the individual is problemless. Instead of controlling his emotions, he finds that they no longer arise within him to be controlled. But when he has reached the point represented by this picture, and his nature has been fully inwardly transmuted, then there is no longer any need for the eternal watchfulness of consciousness over the conduct of the person. Consciousness is no longer a policeman. Morality, ethics, conscience are no longer the heartless dictators of conduct. The enlightened mind, the redeemed emotions, the purified body, these are now dwelling forever in peace together. There is no longer any problem, any rise of problem. Nothing can lure the consciousness away from the simple dignity of its own peacefulness. Though there may be confusion around it, it will never be confused again. It has formed its inward pact with reality. And the individual then has the strange freedom of being able to do anything that he wants to do because he will never want to do anything that isn't good. This is a very high degree of your Zen mysticism but it is represented in this picture. The boy is no longer even watching the ox. The ox is now completely subdued, and it drinks of the edge of a stream, which in this view divides it from the boy. And in the uh, Buddhist philosophy, and also in most other religions, by the way, you have this stream of water. In the old Christian theology, it was the Jordan. And the old hymns about gathering on the other shore to welcome souls uh, that have uh, come finally uh, to the bank of the river between this world and the next. The Egyptians had their celestial Nile that flowed through the Elysian fields, making them fertile. And in Buddhism, there is a strange ocean across which the ship of the doctrine carries souls to peace and truth. And at this stage in the development of our story, there is between the boy and the ox the mysterious river of life that divides form from spirit, divides one world from the other, and this um, mysterious divider uh, was always shown in the old mystery religions and things of that nature as a kind of temptation, a test or a trial that the individual had to learn to bridge in some way through his own understanding. He must build a bridge to bind the worlds together. For the spirit belongs in one region and the body in another. But the ox now is drinking of the waters of foreverness. It has no longer 
bound itself to the material plane or the material garden in which it lived. It is seeking also the everlasting waters of the Spirit, that those who drink thereof shall never thirst again. So we find the, the purified ox now also beginning its acceptance of the great universal mystery of life nutrition. It is beginning to live not on the bread of this world, but upon the fruits of the Spirit. And little by little, its dependency upon nature, its dependency on the earth, its dependency on all mundane things is lessened. It has a source of food ye know not of. It has a source of constant wealth and strength and insight that falls out of everlastingness. So the uh, ox in its own quiet way is attaining its discipleship. It is becoming uh, the redeemed and purified and vitalized instrument for the manifestation of consciousness itself a very pleasant, pastoral, happy scene. The mountains are not as veiled as they were before, and uh, everything seems to suggest a wonderful enrichment and a wonderful purposefulness in all that happens. And so we come finally uh, to the next scene. And in the next scene, something strange has happened. The earth has disappeared. The outer world has vanished utterly, and our ox, now I might say, looking a little embarrassed by it all, is wandering around on a beautiful feathery cloud, which is a very difficult place for an ox to be. It seems to be almost up to its knees in clouds, and it is... Uh, becoming almost like the mysterious heavenly ox of the Chinese fable of the Bridge of Magpies, which is one of the old legends of the uh, shepherd boy and his ox, and the spinning maiden who wove the garments of the star gods. It's a very beautiful old Chinese fable. But now the ox is beginning to look the embarrassed part of a saint in its own right. Uh, the uh, boy is still there, but he seems to be standing on some intangible ground also. There are no longer any mountains, there are no longer any rivers, but in the sky is a ball that may represent the sun, and also four stars linked together with lines, the ancient Chinese way of representing a constellation. So the bull is now being picked up or gathered up like the Mithraic bull that was raised to become the constellation of Taurus. Now the symbol of the personality is moved out of worldliness entirely. And the individual, having achieved a very much higher state of meditation, is now advancing into the unregenerated ox. But that as these faculties are regenerated, he returns to his universal citizenship. That he, not, he neither needs the world, and for in that matter does the world need him. For the world will never understand him, and he will never understand the other. The boy and the ox, strangely, have an interval between them, which is not easy to cross. Yet each in its own way achieves a victory over the mystery of separateness. And that is represented in this particular story. In meditation, uh, the being and its mind, the emotions, the whole psychic integration that we know, suddenly experiences an aloneness in space. The self and the personality together float in the clouds. They are no longer attached or related to any objectivity whatsoever. 
Yet the meditating mystic still thinks, still feels, is still moved by all the most uh, refined and transmuted emotions and moods. But still these things are not tied to earth. He does not need this earth to know beauty. He does not need this world to know wisdom. He does not require this physical planet on which to stand nor does he need any of the things which belong to it. For strangely, all things necessary are in himself, and always have been. And in himself is the comradeship and companionship of the eternal. So in our picture, the meditating mystic has suddenly experienced his own existence in a vast and infinite area of eternal being. In his meditation has left the world behind. Although he may still be seated upon old earth itself, he has forgotten it. He looks out with a clarified vision and beholds only the stars and space and himself. And he looks out from within himself to the outer part of himself. He looks from his soul through his eyes. And his soul is the boy and his eyes are the ox. <laughs> They are still two beings, but they have become much closer, and it is through the eyes of the ox that the boy sees the fields of space, even as the meditating mystic is aware by his inner sensory perception of his own relationship to both time and eternity. He still is. He still experiences the strange, fleeting sense of selfness. As long as self remains, the ox is there. But the ox in space, like the self in space, is at disadvantage. Because space does not belong to selves. It belongs to eternities. So it is only reasonable and natural that we should turn the next page. And suddenly, we have another peculiar situation. We are back again to the uh, situation we started with. We are back to the point where the boy is standing again in the garden or by the side of the cliffs and mountains on the edge of a precipice overlooking the sea and above him also are clouds and mountains and the sky the constellation shines forth. The boy holds up his hand in amazement, there is no bowl. Something has happened. This very ethereal bowl that was floating around on the clouds has now vanished utterly. And in this vanishment of the bowl, in the ancient concept of the mystic of mystic meditation, the individual has simply extinguished the sense of separateness between its own nature and every other nature in space. And as the Swami Vivekananda tells us in, in his work on Raja Yoga, there is suddenly only one. And if we want to say that uh, what, uh, from one perspective to another, we can say this one is myself. Or we can also, with equal propriety, say this one is something else, everything else. But if the one is self, then everything is part of self. If the one is the something else, then I am part of something else, because I can only be one. And it is either I or not I. If it is I, I include all. If it is not I, then I am included in all. And the boy holds up his hands in astonishment. The whole mystery of duality has vanished in the Pythagorean monad. But here, it is hard to know what really happened to the ox. Whether the boy has transmuted the ox into himself, whether he has cast aside the instrumentality of the sensory perception whether they have been absorbed back into the spirit from which they came, 
when a man now experiences with new faculties, faculties that are no longer individualized or personified, but have an enduring existence in a universal condition. And in any event, man reaches what might be termed in Buddhism the Bodhisattva experience. He comes very close now uh, to the portals of the Supreme Mystery. He has observed one by one everything vanishing away. Each step of the path, something that was dark has become lighter. Something that has, li has become lighter has become fainter. And so at last, there's nothing really left but a point of consciousness. It is as though a person was passing slowly into sleep. The last memory was this strange sense of existence. No longer where we exist or how we exist or what moves or motivates our existence but just this one fleeting realization that we must exist. Because without this existence, we could not know that our existence was slipping away. So there is this mysterious movement in which nothing remains of the elaborate complex of self, of person, of things, of emotions, of appetites, of desires, of ambitions, of hopes, of fears, and resolutions. Now there is nothing remaining of these things except a kind of conscious watcher, a beholder of things that can behold everything but itself, but has reached that point in which there is no longer anything to behold. We come to the very uh, edge of our supreme problem. Namely, if there is no illusion in man, if there is no further retention of worldliness, if there is no link between the individual and the corporeality which he has left behind, then is it not true that in meditation the world fades out? that all these things have a ceasing because they no longer are needed. And that which is not necessary does not endure. So the boy, to his astonishment, sees the whole elaborate pageantry of his own nature evaporate. He sees his memory and his mind and his thoughts and his feelings all fading away. Yet in a mysterious manner he exists, for he is capable of seeing them fade. He is capable of surviving the loss of the bull, which means that the individual life, the consciousness in man, is capable of surviving the death of the mind. And this is one of the great points in Zen philosophy. And I think it is one of the points that will sometime have to be reconsidered in Western cycles, where we are going to have to realize that it is the thought that produces the thinker and not the thinker producing the thought. That in the beginning was not the mind, but the thought. And the thought was everywhere and in everything. And in order to express itself, the thought brought forth the mind. And the mind became the instrument of thought and soul the mind. But the mind can die again, and the thought remains. And this thought is a kind of vagr a vagrant sense of existence, moving and floating upon the deep sea of meditation. And in it we find the, the concept of the bodhisattvic life, in which by degrees the individual comes so close to the, the, the dividing line between the state of being and the state of eternity uh, that he can hardly realize uh, which he occupies at any given time. And so we then turn the diagram uh, from this to the tenth figure. 
the last of the people. And what do we have? The boy is gone. The ox is gone. The trees are gone. And all that remains is the Zen Taoist symbol of eternity, the circle. This is the circle that a good Zen priest can draw with one stroke of the brush, and it will be perfect. A perfect circle drawn freehand. But in this circle is the end of the mystery, either for Taoism or for Zen. For now there is nothing that remains except the infinite mystery itself. The mystery of the Samadhi. The mystery of the Mahar Paranavana. The mystery of the dying out of all the fires of existence. The end of suffering. The end of the long road that leads to the end of suffering. There is no longer the shepherd or the ox. There is no longer that which causes pain or that which experiences pain. There is no longer the thought flying out like a bird seeking a place to land. There is no longer any land. There is no longer anything except the infinite expanse of the inevitable itself. And this is the Buddha says the drop of water has returned to the infinite ocean. All separateness has ceased. All condition as we know it has ceased. And if you wish to know the incredible profundity of this mystery, you only have to remember that it happens to you every night when you go to sleep. Suddenly, you are not. And yet, not having an existence, you are never aware completely or totally of the end of an existence. And suddenly, in the morning, you awaken again, out of not existence into existence again. And you pick up the threads and strains of life, and you go on. And each little day we live is rounded by a sleep. And all of us can sometimes wonder where the dream really is, whether man is dreaming of strange things or whether strange things are dreaming of man. We do not know, but we depend upon certain orientations to clarify. There are examples known in which dream life and active life have been so closely interrelated that it has been impossible for the individual to tell which was the dream and which the reality. This is part of our problem. But then, uh, ends not in a frustration, in the sense that Western scholars have insisted on assuming that the Buddhists were nihilists, that they were some strange type of extinctionists, in which to them the supreme end of everything was to be nothing. This is the first thought that may come to mind. The idea that the only way you can escape from pain is to die. The only way you can escape from your mind is for the mind to die or for you to die and leave the mind behind. This is not really the substance of the matter at all, however. Well, there is a great deal more to this Buddhist philosophy than extinction. We have extinguished the man, and we have extinguished the ox. The world is gone, and nothing but the circle remains. And the circle is reality. So how shall we estimate the nature of reality? Have we right to say how deep it is, or how wide? Have we any way of estimating what is locked within it? Do we know what potentials may emerge from it? We have the experience here of, be, of beholding an unknown or coming into the presence of a mystery. Perhaps one name we give to this mystery is space, and space is an excellent symbol of Tao. 
But on this side of the mystery, we behold space stretched limitless beyond the galaxies that fill the firmament or are scattered and strewn about through the infinite expansions and extensions of time and distance. And from this invisible, mysterious space, we know we have to derive all that we are. It is from space that comes the atomic and nuclear energy that we fear today. For it means that this thing that seems to be empty around us is really filled with an infinite life so vast that it can shatter in an instant all the material structures that it supports. So we see from this mystery of space flowing downward into matter the infinite diversity of creation. We see coming out of space all the planets and all the lives upon them. We see man coming out of space. We know that his nutrition is derived from space. Everything that we know, everything that we are, began somewhere, somehow, as a seed in something that we cannot see, and the seed itself we could not see. And only after ages of growth did this thing become manifest to us. So we are indeed like a great tree with its roots in an invisible heaven above, a silent, abstract earth that seems to be utterly transparent and to go on forever and to be fully empty. And yet, we have to be wrong. For this space, which is the most rarefied of atmospheres, contains everything that has ever been or ever can be, even as it supports everything that at present exists. What happens then if we now ascend uh, to union with this space that to now we have considered emptiness? Supposing this space was a strange wall, invisible, but nevertheless as adamantine, as the hardest and most unbreakable granite. Supposing this space is the mysterious looking glass of Alice, who not only gave us the little story of her adventures in Wonderland, but tells us of how she went through the looking glass uh, to another world. What would happen if we stepped through to the other side of space? Would it be empty? Would it be a complete vacuum? Is it possible that beyond space itself there is this other side, and that from this other side other things are being generated, created, and fashioned? to flow out into other dimensions of existence we know nothing of. Buddhism takes the position that when man is restored to identity with reality, which is the Mahaparamavana, then in that moment he is born for the first time into the true universe. He is born into the world as it really is. He goes out of the sphere of seeming into the sphere of being. And he comes, therefore, not to the end of everything, but merely to the waking out of a sleep. And what we call the reabsorption into eternity through meditation is the gradual releasing of the individual from the nightmare of some strange dream which he calls existence. But what we call this way of life is a dreaming of the spirit. And suddenly, in the Mahaparanavana, the individual awakens. He awakens from the nightmare of selfishness. He awakes from the horrid dreams of pain. He wakes from all these doubts and fears about the finality of things. He, wake, he awakes from the terrors of an atomic age. He awakes uh, from the ruthlessness of competitive en enterprise, from the endless thoughtlessness of mortals. 
suddenly this universe changes. He then realizes that what he has called life was this life of seeming, this life of make-believe, this life which was nothing but the elaborate tapestry woven by his own sensory perception. A world of illusion that exists only because he has faculties of illusion with which to cognize it. A world that has substance only because it comes within the registry of a strange insubstantial pattern within himself. So just as a man in a terrible nightmare is rescued suddenly by awaking, and in an instant finds himself back in a reasonable existence. So to the Buddhist of ancient times, the Mahaparanavana was this waking up into a real existence. What it was like, we cannot know. What it means, we cannot even comprehend. But we believe it and hold it firmly to be the beginning of man's true existence. We hold it to be something which, when it is attained, brings to the individual for the first time a positive relationship with life, instead of being forever opposed to life, instead of being forever under the displeasure of willful gods or under the pressure of unchanging laws. Man suddenly, for the first time, comes into the benevolence of the all-beautiful, the all-wonderful, and the all-good. And in order to signify this wonderful, incredible state of things, the Mahayana Buddhists, from which the Zen derived most of its teaching, picture against the mysterious background of the cosmic shades and shadows the rising figures of the Dhyana Buddhas. He re they recognize there that somewhere behind the veil of things there will sit in eternal meditation the mysterious realities that govern all things. So these realities go on forever in the quiet, unchanging contemplation of the infinite itself. Man can only find these beings by becoming like them. He knows them when he discovers the realities in himself, and as he finds in his own heart and soul the quietude of the meditative life, the dim shadows of these great meditating principles uh, begin to intrigue him, uh, begin to mean something to him, something away from and apart from all this worldliness which we generally consider. So in the story of the Ten Bulls, we end with a circle that seems to be frustration, but which is actually ultimate and inevitable opportunity. Man moves from the finite which boxes him in to the infinite in which there are no limitations upon himself. But he finds this unlimited existence only a vacuum as far as his present faculties and sensibilities and conditions of consciousness are concerned. He cannot know the meanings of these things that lie beyond. When the bull and the boy have both vanished, when the world of things as we know the world simply no longer endures. Yet the boy and the bull have not ultimately or utterly vanished. That which has a nature never ceases. That which has an existence somewhere within it can never cease existing. And as Buddha himself tells us, he says, I am not an extinctionist. I am not an atheist. I am not one who teaches the exhaustion of life into darkness and not being. He says, rather, that what he teaches is a way of life that leads to the end of sorrow. You notice that in all the Buddhist writings, there is no actual statement of man attaining happiness. 
There is no un, in the, no Buddhist statement to the fact that someday man is going to uh, be filled with unspeakable joy. There is no radiant heaven world in old Buddhism such as we have in other religions, although Mahayana to a measure filled this interval with a blessed region. But in the original teachings of Buddha, there was no promise of good. There was simply the promise of the end of evil. This is because in the philosophy of Buddha, uh, the, human, the human being, the human mind, the human nature is simply incapable of a positive statement of reality. We cannot define that which we consider as ultimate good. What we can do only is to define that which is not good. Therefore, we cannot say what this thing will be, but we can gradually remove from it those qualities which we know that it cannot be. We cannot, therefore, say we come in the end to great joy, but rather, as far as we can tell, we come in the end to great quietude, the great quietude of the circle. We have come to the end of pain. We have come to the end of sorrow. Now, what is the state of no longer being sorrow sorrowful? Is this merely another way of saying we have found joy? Is the absolute extinction of sadness the full expression of joy? Or is there some strangely quiet thing in which there is neither joy nor sorrow? And if for that matter we think carefully, is this not in itself, this quietude, the ultimate joy? These things we do not know. We can only use the faculties that we have to estimate as best we can. To Buddhism, the nearest we can come to reality is to extinguish the illusion. When we are no longer deceived by that which is not so, we are free. When we are no longer victims of the unreasonable, victims of ignorance, superstition, and fear within ourselves, Big, uh, victims of selfishness, self-interest, but gradually we have released ourselves from these falsenesses. Then we have finally come as far as man could come. For these purifications of man's nature exhaust man, and that which is left when man is no longer imperfect in any respect, that which is left we can hardly call man. When we have taken everything from man which divides him from a superior form of life, only that superior form then continues. So what we know of man, what we know as man, is merely the human imperfection. The man we know exists only because he is not complete. If he becomes complete, he vanishes away. If he becomes perfect, he is no longer recognizable. He is beyond our grasp, beyond our span of thinking. So when we say that man becomes perfect, we are actually extinguishing man himself. When we say that man becomes completely good, we are extinguishing all of the qualities of his nature. For in the perfection of anything, there is relief from all the stress and striving of parts and things unfinished. So all this stream of fragments, all these diverse pressures and appetites and attitudes flow back into the mysterious circle from which they came. And then, as it were, the door of the circle closes, and there is nothing here anymore. But this has no, this is in no way evidence that anything has ceased. And this merely means that everything has its full existence beyond our faculties. The only part of us that is real we cannot see. 
The only part of the infinite that is real we cannot see. All that we can see are the extensions of things, the bones and framework of a living creature. But the living creature is invisible. And just as the soul of man cannot be known directly by any sense that we possess, so likewise the soul of the universe is not in the stars, not in the elements, not in the vast pageantries of things, but as a silent mystery behind these things. Yet it is the soul that has made all else possible. It is the life in man that, though invisible, makes him alive. If things then all return to their invisibles, it merely re means that they have returned to their realities, the rock of life itself the very substance that is unchanging. And if in the wisdom of the infinite mind and the infinite consciousness uh, it is bright and proper, from this dark, mysterious mystery of the void, as the Chinese call it, from this doctrine of the void, from this invisible center of the strange ring of existence, there can at any time pour forth the seeds of worlds. For well, this mysterious circle is full of life in every part. It is germinal and seminal. Everything that is alive comes from it and returns to it. So that there is no right to say that the things that disappear cease. Any more than it is right to say that things exist only because they appear. These are attitudes that we have. But in Buddhist psychology, we go beyond these. We go to the position or the relation of things to themselves only, not their relation to other things. And out of this concept, I think we can get the main pattern or picture of the story of the Ten Bowls, which is, of course, something we can meditate on for years if we want to, without ever exhausting its potential. But it does challenge in us the consideration of all these old legends and this fables, this fabled story and the lore and the wisdom of antiquity. And each will interpret it some way according to his own insight and will identify he is either the boy or the bull, that he is both, that he is neither. And lastly, he is the circle that goes on forever. It has neither beginning nor end. And by these identities, he discovers his own growth, the mystery of existence. Well, I think our time is pretty well up, so that's our little story. And we hope that you will find it interesting and worthy of consideration. And if you don't have a copy of the book, I think you might want to have it, because... I don't know where you're going to find these pictures more conveniently than in this little volume, so we leave it to your consideration. I'd like to also call your attention that this evening, after our talk, our little gift shop will be open, and also our library with its exhibit and with other art treasures and things there for you to see, in order that as the time to Christmas gets nearer and nearer, you could do a little last-minute shopping or perhaps look around a little and relax in a rather pleasant atmosphere in the pressures of last-minute shopping. In any event, also I would say that although we have no class here next Wednesday evening, the gift shop will also be open Wednesday evening next week so that if you have the time and the inclination, perhaps you will find here a convenient place to do a little of your last-minute shopping. I might also point out that in our gift shop you can secure gift coupons or little gift certificates uh, in which uh, you can give your friend a little card, a rather attractive, beautiful Christmas card, which they can come in with and select whatever they wish to secure for themselves. So if you're in doubt about what to get someone, perhaps one of these gift certificate cards will be appropriate. We hope you will take a look at the exhibit in the library. We think it is uh, a very good story of the unfoldment of man's consciousness and his struggle for learning. 
And we think that it tells how, uh, perhaps symbolically at least, Ben captured his thoughts and his dreams and his hopes, the mysterious forms of letters and of words and of characters and sentences. And these, in a way, became also these symbolic oxen that became the instruments of his own purpose. Man identified with his thoughts, put them into words, and created literature. Created a world of learning for other men to enjoy. Men passing through the ages of learning turned from one book to another, from one leaf to another, until they found in the simple stories of Zen perhaps the whole substance of the written word. You will find some interesting examples of man's struggles for learning, struggles for insight, and how he gradually recorded the best that he knew uh, for the good of other men. In the history of the written word in our library exhibit, we think you will find interesting. So we hope you'll visit the, the gift shop and the library, and we will see you all, we hope, next Sunday. Thank you very much.